Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, we are super excited to welcome a parent, a uh, good friend, uh, Blair, uh, Mr. Dan Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain, as you've heard, is a longtime environmental educator uh, and is here to talk with us today about uh, Costa Rica and its efforts at maintaining biodiversity. That's all you did. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thanks for joining me in this beautiful space, guys. We're uh, very fortunate indeed. So much going on here. Um, so uh, I'll get right into it because uh, Dr. Miller told me to you know, keep my remarks somewhat short, and he was fairly adamant about it. And, uh, I will try to do that. I have a, a slideshow um, that's basically a compilation of photographs that have been taken, uh, geez, over the course of at least a decade. Um, so. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a tour, an inside look at our experiences um, inside the country of Costa Rica, and also talk a little bit at the end about some of the challenges that tropical nations have in protecting their huge, huge biological heritage. Um, and I know that you've, you've heard uh, about rainforests and um, you know the biodiversity that they contain and all of that, and maybe you've been hearing about it your whole life like I was, uh, but it's real. Uh, it's mind-bending and it's sadly disappearing. So we'll cover uh, mostly the good stuff tonight and maybe just a little bit for you to think about at the end. So uh, yes, my name is Dan Chamberlain. Uh, in 1998, uh, a good colleague of mine who recently retired, Tom Miller, who teaches anthropology at Kennedy High School, and I collaborated with what we thought was an innovative idea to take students out of the country to Costa Rica. And our sites were originally set on South America I wouldn't say that Costa Rica is a drawback from that at all. Um, and there's lots of reasons why Costa Rica turned out to be the perfect destination for what we had in mind, which was to establish and develop a school of tropical conservation uh, and research. And, um, you know, we had a, a big plan, and it, it kind of took on a life of its own over the years. Um, and what's, what's evolved is, uh, to this point, about 150 Kittatini High School students have been to probably five or six different habitat types, eco-region types, uh, in this tiny country. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a tour through it, and um, do, do not wait until the end for questions. If you uh, have, I know, the teachable moment and how fleeting uh, ideas can be, so if, uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. It's a nice small venue, so we should be able to, to take this uh, you know, as it comes. So um, this particular image is actually um, in this, one of the southernmost national parks of Costa Rica called Corcovado. Corcovado is a jewel in the conservation world. It's probably the uh, centerpiece of Costa Rica's conservation efforts. 800,000 acres. Uh, it's the largest continuous rainforest in Central America. And it's on uh, largely the Pacific Slope. So what you see behind this group assembled here, various states of dress, sorry about that, um, is the Pacific Ocean. And it's one of the places where rainforest comes right to the sea. Uh, which is something that we're not used to at all in this particular climate zone. So I have a, yet another a compilation of some various trips in, in different parts of the country, just as far as backdrops. Uh, the nature of our program has been uh, one of complete immersion. So we didn't stay at a lot of the cushy places that Costa Rica is known for in the resort communities. We uh, wore backpacks, we brought everything with us on our backs, we uh, set up camp. We got smarter in later years when we looked for pavilions and gazebos at biological research stations uh, because sometimes the weather and the, and the elements are very unpredictable. But uh, you can kind of see a little, in a little bit of these the type of gear that, that we set ourselves up with uh, from cooking uh, to freeze-dried meals to the clothing, which uh, we had been field testing for about a decade before we finally decided on uh, light and durable. So in either case, this also gives you an idea of the size of the groups that we took down to Costa Rica as well. Um, we're looking at groups of anywhere from 9 to 15. And more than that, we had some real reservations about personal safety. Uh, less than that, uh, we would not be actually uh, giving students the opportunity to really uh, move into the, the program and, and, uh, and experience it. So um, we'll keep moving here. Oh, right. I haven't looked at this in about an hour. Um, the gentleman on the left is Tom Miller, and uh, he, he does look a little sketchy right there. That's not his real hair. Um, but that's Tom Miller, and uh, he and I developed the program 
pretty much from scratch. Uh, and then uh, the two uh, women on the right, uh, the one with the hat on, you'll actually see a lot of her photos. She photo documented several trips. Uh, and so we actually um, have uh, seen uh, Lindsay Sadowski and Mary Simpson return many times as chaperones. So they weren't scared off at all. They came back for more. And, uh, these are the four principal people that actually kind of steered the program through uh, administrative uncertainty and, and also um, you know the decades since we actually since its inception. Costa Rica by the numbers. I hope I remember these numbers. Um, I thought this was a really clever way to present some data about Costa Rica, and I was inspired by the Blair webpage, Blair at a glance. So uh, anyway, yes, there is some uh, relevant data here, though. Uh, you're looking at um, the seven regions, cultural regions of the country, uh, more or less. So Guanacaste up in the north, the Osa Peninsula, uh, where Corcovado is down here in the south, Telemanc and the Central Valley up near San Jose, which is where the primary uh, city, the capital city is, um, San Jose, and also their major airport, uh, Juan Santa Maria International Airport, who was named after a really central character in Costa Rican lore, as it turns out. I won't have time to share that with you, but I will tell you where you can get some good reading on that. So 0.03% is the landmass that Costa Rica makes in terms of the terrestrial landmass on the planet. So it's a tiny, tiny country at the same area as West Virginia. It is reputed to house 5% of the world's biodiversity. Okay, so if you do the math, um, it's, it's just a stunning, stunning place uh, to visit if biodiversity is what you're after. Uh, 801 miles of coastline, 121 volcanic regions. It is a volcanic country, it's part of the Rim of Fire. Uh, seven active volcanoes, some of them are very celebrated. Uh, Arenal is a, a, a tourist destination for a lot of people and it erupts every 40 minutes pretty much on schedule. Um, we didn't visit them. 12,533 feet in altitude is the highest peak. I put that there because I wanted you to appreciate how vertical this country is. 52, um, 52, I'll come back to that one. Ah, yes, 52 species of hummingbirds. Okay. Uh, we have one in New Jersey, you may have seen it, okay? Um, five species of primate, uh, we saw four, and there's reputed to be um, a species down here, uh, nearer to the Panama uh, border. Um, so, five species of primate, 750,000 uh, species of insects, and still counting. 20,000 species of arachnids, that's not going to make you want to go there, so we'll skip that 10% of the world's butterflies. One forest in Costa Rica, La Selva, is a major research destination for a lot of ecological uh, research and study. Uh, had over, cataloged over 200 species of butterflies in one forest. 25% of Costa Rica is committed to conservation or locked up as refuges or national parks. So 25% of the land area. 4.1 million people and growing. That's one of the pressures that we'll talk about. 96% uh, literacy rate, and zero, no branches of the military. They do not have a standing army. Uh, the only reason I say that is because they can often put a lot of those resources towards conservation, which Costa Ricans are fiercely proud of. So, yes? Um, do you go on the street with an organization? Like, like where do you, like, how do you uh, Great question. Uh, we actually um, envisioned running it by ourselves because we wanted that autonomy and that freedom, it became easy to join with an organization that still operates in Costa Rica called EcoTeach. So early in the uh, formative years of the program, we coupled with EcoTeach for three or four trips and then we uh, slowly moved away and did our own thing as we got more uh, acclimated to the country, to the ways, the culture, the contacts down there in terms of you know, where we fly into, who's picking us up, who are they? Do they know us? So EcoTeach really facilitated a lot of that early on. Still an active organization for uh, ecotourism in Costa Rica and education, and education as well. Yeah, because I did a uh, National Geographic trip to Belize. Oh, no, so that's awesome. So maybe uh, if there's time, we can hear a little bit more about you know, your experiences. So. Questions so far, other than that. Okay, these are the four major zones of study that we were interested in. Uh, and the reason why I'm putting it out to you is because in the north, uh, there's a lot of tropical dry forest. 
Okay, and that's a distinctly different type of ecosystem that you might find down here in this lowland wet rainforest uh, down near Corcovado. Uh, and so both of those destinations um, have, been, have been places where we've taken our students to do research, but not on the same trip, because it would be a tremendous, it would be an ordeal to get from the north of the country uh, to the south of the country. The, the length of these, the duration of these trips was about 10 days, so we've had to, as, as thrilling as that would be to compare uh, the ecology of the dry forest to the wet rainforest, we, we've not been able to do that. Some students have returned to go back and experience the southern part of the country as well. The smaller circle is Monte Verde, and that's a cloud forest, and that's an entirely different type of uh, ecosystem, uh, and most of the um, relevant inputs of moisture are because of clouds. And so uh, it tends to produce lush foliage without a distinct dry season, but it's only at altitude, up on the mountaintops. Uh, and then this right here is uh, Chiripo, which is the highest peak, um, and we've actually um, experienced some cloud forest there as well. That's that 12,000 foot peak, which is uh, Costa Rica's highest peak. So those were our four studies over the years. I included this picture really just to share with you some of the vertical dimensions of the country and then how simply Costa Ricans live. The, this, the, the capital city, San Jose, is a fairly modern city, uh, but you don't have to travel too far outside the Central Valley to realize that Costa Ricans um, enjoy some of the world's most perfect weather, first of all, uh, but also live quite simply. And, um, and things are a, proceed at a fairly um, you know, casual, casual pace, and, and to adopt and embrace that, that lifestyle while we're down there is part of what we want our kids to do. You know, lose the go, 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 enjoy the place where you are. We have kids that would be, be birding right outside our, uh, right on the porches, you know, and it's just, um, the, the, the biodiversity is not only in the rainforest, it's in the backyards there, kind of like our, you know, New Jersey as well. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, picture was included for that reason. Um, this is a watershed statement. And um, I have to say that Costa Rica has done very well in, in actually preserving their floodplains. And the country floods, we were down there one year and we got a meter of rain in 24 hours. So about almost 39 inches of rain in about 24 hours. And all the roads closed. And I love the Costa Rican response to that. It's like, what a deal. You know, just sit, stay. You know, and that's, that's the response. It's not, let's build a super highway over the floodplain, let's not develop a flood, let's not build dams and, and try to manage the, the river. Let's let the river do what it does. Let's let the river be a river, okay? Uh, as a consequence of that, you can see the flood lines and you can see, if you imagine in the rainy season, what this might look like and how that might be different. A lot of the roads become impassable. Uh, so we go at the beginning of the rainy season um, and we, uh, we've never really been inconvenienced by, um, you know, having to stay in one place for longer than we actually intended, so. A uh, little, little inkling of the cloud forest. This is lowland, actually, but also different types of forest here. This is an elfin forest behind Derek. Um, and so after you get above the tree line, things change radically. Um, and you get a lot of different vegetation types that you wouldn't expect. Uh, if you're thinking that looks like a rubber plant, uh, you'd be right. So uh, again, the different vegetation types and different ecoregions. Um, I tried to actually get this first couple slides to uh, share with you some of the type of vegetation, major types of vegetation that you see there. That's a different look uh, at the same uh, locale. This is uh, the rainforest right to the ocean, right to the sea. This gallery rainforest runs uh, right, to the, right to the ocean on the Pacific Slope. This is Rincon de la Vieja in Guanacaste. It's a, an active volcano. Um, it may seem foolhardy to have teachers take their students on an active volcano, but they seem to like it. And um, the conditions up here are vastly different. So uh, you're looking at what is really quite like a moonscape. And um, the, the fog that you're seeing is tinged with sulfuric acid because the thousand feet down on the left side of this knife edge is a vat, a, a caldera, and it's a beautiful blue color, but it's boiling sulfuric acid. Uh, and typical of Costa Rica, there's no guardrails, there's no fencing, there's no turn it back now. You know, it's just kind of like just, you know, you're, you're up here, you wanted to be here, just be careful, that kind of thing. But, uh, again, very different uh, type of ecoregion at the top of these um, somewhat dormant and active volcanoes. I included this just to show you that life persists. <laughs> this is on the top of the volcano. I, have, I don't know what type of snake this is. My partner and I have kind of puzzled on it. We didn't want to get too close in case it was the lancehead, which is one of Costa Rica's more famous snakes. 
but it was on the sign there, and I can only surmise that a, that a bird of prey dropped it, uh, and it was up there, so uh, we, we included it um, just for, uh, it's one of the oddities. That's the knife edge that I was talking about. So there's a slope to the right and a slope to the left. Uh, and you can really experience vertigo when you're walking on a knife edge. Sometimes it plays uh, tricks on your vision. And so um, at some points we had to actually have a rope and we, we roped our kids uh, together just to give them security more than anything else. There was never any real danger, but sometimes if you feel like it's dangerous, then it is to you. Um, so uh, this is uh, again on top of Ringbone de la Vieja. Going back down, of course, the countryside is dotted with waterfalls, unexpected. Um, and so again, uh, we start to get back down into the zone of vegetation. We start to get back down below um, you know, the watershed. Uh, and healthy and intact forests, of course, are the friends of rivers. And so we see that a lot in Costa Rica. Sometimes we actually had to uh, hire a bush plane to fly our gear into places uh, where conditions on the ground merited that. But I also wanted to include this picture to in part to you that Costa Rica also has a maritime region too, which is part of its biodiversity. So we don't really take advantage too much of the saltwater uh, fauna. Um, we mostly stay on the land, but uh, being so close to the coast, um, Costa Rica's <coughs> marine ecoregions are, are truly stunning too, and some of you may have heard about their, their coral reefs as well. Just a pretty picture. Uh, rivers running to the sea, um, not unusual anywhere in the world, but in this case, uh, while we're moving into Serena, which is the uh, destination for us in Corcovado on the Osa Peninsula, at high tide, the ocean comes quite a bit upstream. And we have read uh, numerous reports uh, that bull shark and South American crocodile um, are there. So we always try to cross these rivers at low tide, um, just because it's always nice to see your feet. Um, and that wasn't always possible because a flash flood up, up river can actually inundate um, you know, the stream where you're trying to cross. But um, I, I'm not saying that to um, make disproportionate any, type, any sense of danger, but there are, there are some places in Costa Rica where, um, where you're fording, fording rivers, uh, you have to do a low tide, and this is one of them. So I hear bull shark is no fun. I've never had an experience with one, but I don't want uh, that either. Uh, beach hikes, this is beach almond. And one of the ways into uh, the reserve was to do it along the beach. We'd have to leave very early in the morning because the tropical sun would not be a friend by even 10.30 in the morning. So we would leave while it was still dark um, and head uh, down the beach and then back into the forest. And it was about 15 miles from where we stayed to where we wanted to be so that we could see the most biodiversity. These are our footprints. And this is on the Pacific Slope. Now, Costa Rica is a country that has a spine that runs the length of it from north to south called the Telemancas. And so the country is essentially either the Pacific Slope or the Caribbean Slope. Uh, and that vertical, the verticality, that vertical dimension actually gives it some of its biodiversity. Because you get the montane species, you get the lowland species, and you get all the species in between. And then some of those species have what's called an altitudinal migration, like uh, resplendent quetzal, for example. Um, like the trogons, they actually will feed and then winter at different elevations. And so Costa Rica supports and provides for all of those habitats. Driftwood. Big driftwood. Uh, Costa Rican bridge. No worries. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, uh, they were constantly doing road work down there because the elements are, are so tough on infrastructure. Leaf cutter ants, uh, just, they're interesting for so many reasons, from an entomological perspective to ecological to the fact that they may, really, they may very well be the first farmers on our planet. Uh, leaf cutters, you may or may not know, actually don't actually feed on the foliage that they harvest. And you can tell where they've been because it looks like that. Um, they actually let the foliage um, slightly decompose and it grows a certain type of fungus it's mixed with their saliva, and that's the only place where that fungus actually exists, and then they feed on the fungus. So, in a sense, it's actually a real type of agriculture. Uh, Costa Rica's ant diversity is off the charts, we don't need to get into that. If I see you guys squirming in your seats, I'll notice that. Uh, Kill Bill Toucan, Toucan Sam, um, one of the great iconic birds of Costa Rica. Um, so we've had several really, really great looks at these birds through the years. That's no, not such a great, that is Scarlet Macaw, uh, one of the 
bird sadly that's quite in danger because of the pet trade. Uh, their feathers are <clears throat> highly prized by collectors as well. Costa Rica uh, protects uh, struggling falls wherever they occur. So they like to actually roost uh, in, a, in the mangroves and then venture into the forest to feed and then roost in the mangroves again where there's fewer predators. Uh, obviously parrots are very smart. Birds you probably know that and macaws are no different. I've read in multiple places that they mate for life. So if you see a single macaw, it lost its mate somewhere. Um, so it's kind of cool. We can always be in places where you know the macaws are returning. Harlequin dart frog. This is Dendrobates. This is a poison dart frog. Uh, at one particular camp called Laleona, they're everywhere. Uh, they don't really present any danger, but they're super cool. And they have their own little migration up the trees. So at the uh, time of day, it's a daily migration, diurnal migration. Um, so we're, your best chance of seeing the dark fox, of course, were at night. Some of the microfauna, got a skink in the left and what looks like a house lizard. Uh, on the right, I, I say it looks like because I really, our amphibian guides were not up to the job down there and our reptile guides. Uh, there's just too much that's not in the, the literature, as it turns out. You guys know this one, this is the iguana. And I was right outside our campsite, just basking in the sun. The basilisk. Um, these are the guys that actually run on water. So they've taken on a moniker down there and in the literature, the Jesus Christ lizard. I don't know if that's as respectful as it should be, but we called it, we just said basiliscus. Uh, so very uh, interesting looking lizard for sure. It's so eyelash viper. Um, and and uh, Ms. Sadowski actually got these photos, and I think they're some of the best photos of this particular snake. Uh, Costa Rica has amazing serpent diversity. Some of them are quite dangerous, and the Costa Ricans um, have a rightful fear of them, especially the workers in the sugarcane fields, where some of these snakes will go after the rodents and, of course, um, represent a real and present danger to the workers there. We've never had a bad experience with a viper. Uh, we've had some close encounters, but uh, nothing that actually even intimated uh, an aggressive uh, posture or, or attitude. Uh, but this is just one of those iconic snakes. And uh, this is a plantain. And upon closer inspection, of course, there's a palm viper in it. So you have to be careful when you put your hands as well, uh, especially in uh, some of these habitats that are very dense. And it's a boa constrictor. Right outside the camp. And uh, this is probably estimated between 10 and 11 feet. Not really a, a danger to any of any of us, probably not even small children. So really after um, eggs from ground nesting birds and, and rodents, of course. Rodent biodiversity makes up most of the mammal diversity in the tropics. I, that might be disappointing to hear, uh, but it's true. Um, so if you're a mammologist or, or a, you know, aspiring mammologist, you're going to know your rodent ID and you're going to go to the tropics and you're going to get really good at it and then you're going to write a field guide and be famous. And then you can go after the primates. Right, and some of the other really cool mammals that are down there. Crocodiles, this is a South American crocodile. This is the Rio Tarcolis, a river that we actually would go to just so our kids could actually lean over the bridge and get um, as close as they wanted to, but a safe distance away from the crocodiles. Um, this, this river is highly polluted, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's brick plants upstream, and, the, and so the water has a little bit of thermal pollution, so it's unusually elevated its temperature, and the crocs seem to really dig that. So the Costa Ricans will have their Sunday picnics and then they'll come to the bridge over the Rio Tarcoles and they'll throw chickens down to these things to see them actually fight it out. And it's, uh, it's a little disconcerting for me um, because you know the, the, the rounds on the, on the bridge are only thigh high and um, it's easy to be excited about these prehistoric crocodilians, but um, I have to tell you that I was always happy and relieved when we got back uh, on our bus and left the crocodiles to do their thing. Kawadi, uh, one of the more common mammals uh, in the raccoon family. It's also called the nose bear. Uh, your gear is not safe. They will find it. And they will actually do amazing acrobatic stunts to get at even the tiniest morsel of food or soap that you may have left unattended. So uh, we actually um, had made, <laughs> we had kind of Kawadis that would get into our food and we'd have no food, but we still had three days in the spot. So the only option was to send someone back to hike out, get on a bus, go to the nearest uh, you know, town, which in this case was Liberia up in the north, buy food, get back on the bus, come back down, and you know, just pretty awkward stuff, but, uh, but that's all because of this mammal, which we loved anyway. It's often the favorite of kids. You can see how intelligent they are. I'm going to speed it up a bit. Very rare photo of a tapir. Um, 
So we, uh, in the lowland in Corcovado, it's the, almost some of the last major tapir populations. And if tapir's there, then you know jaguar's there too. And we never saw jaguar, we saw jaguar sign. We had a jaguar researcher uh, talk to us one night. Uh, there were prints of cougar and jaguar on trails that were following us, but we never, never saw jaguar. But these are the types of megafauna that the big cats would be after, and that's why Corcovado is this jewel of biodiversity because it's, it goes from top to bottom. You know, in terms of all the niches are filled with the big cats that should be there are there, uh, and that's largely because of prey species like tapir. Uh, these are more dangerous than they look, and I won't get into it for right now. But the males startle easily, and they weigh about 500 pounds. And if you happen to be in their way, they're not going to notice you. So. We were, I was always a little bit tense whenever tapir were in, were in the area because they're immensely interesting. Um, but, and also somewhat curious, but also they could be unpredictable. One of the most intelligent mammals on the planet, humans notwithstanding, uh, the white-faced monkey, sometimes called a capuchin. And uh, we had major, major encounters with these that were, that, that lasted for hours, but it seemed like seconds. They're so intelligent and actually uh, some, um, some portions of our group were threatened by, by dominant males. Um, you know, not get, get to the point where you back away, because you're not sure exactly what they have in mind. So they're immensely curious and immensely intelligent, and will often uh, commit to thievery in your camp. Anything shiny, uh, they seem to like, and so they'll go after it. The smallest primate, the squirrel monkey, he's pretty proud of himself. He's got a cicada there, I think, or no, it looks like a, a Katie did, you yeah. know? The howler monkey, the loudest mammal in Costa Rica, uh, it's reported that their uh, vocalizations can be heard from five miles away. This is an anteater, an arboreal anteater. Uh, and again, a very lucky photo, but a very rare photo. You guessed it, we have some of these ourselves. But there's again, uh, 10 times as many species of squirrels down there. And then, this is a little bit on vegetation, I'll speed it up a bit. Uh, this is a strangler fig, and it has its own ecology that's worth reporting on. So the strangler fig is actually a vine, and it's an epiphy it's epiphytic at, at the start, okay, meaning it's an air plant. And then it sends its tendrils to the ground, and they seek a host tree, okay, and then they actually grow up the tree as these tiny little thread-like filaments. And then over time they grow, and they'll completely encase the tree. And as they do that, they parasitize the tree. So full-grown strangler figs are hollow inside because the host tree used to be there, but it died and rotted away. And, and so these really make up a huge amount of biomass in the tropical forests. Uh, it works out very well because um, they actually operate as a food court as well. A lot of wildlife can be seen at ripening figs. So it's good to just go there, sit yourself down with your binoculars and your notepad, and watch what comes. And they come in in phalanxes of feeding hierarchies. Uh, so the strangler fig is immensely interesting to me personally, because I'm a plant guy. Um, and um, I just thought that their particular ecology was, uh, was tr truly amazing. So another strangler fig. This is a blowdown. And any time a tree would be blown down because of storm damage, because the lianas, the vines, form a network in the canopy, one large tree will take down a swath measuring many football fields. And so these openings, now receiving sunlight, actually start responding to that in the most amazing way. All kinds of fruiting plants uh, start to regenerate there, and so they're great opportunities for wildlife, these blowdowns. Bromeliads, these are epiphytes. Uh, they're just amazing. Some of these tree limbs support 10 tons in mass of the epiphytes. Uh, I read somewhere one of the leading causes of death in the rainforest in Costa Rica and other places were because of um, tree limbs breaking under the weight of the bromeliads. We never experienced anything close to that. Various floras, just uh, something that's always in flower. So. Of course, how uh, far would you guys backpack per trip? Per trip, that's a good question. We um, probably uh, totaled somewhere between 60 and 70 miles for that 10 days. Um, and, and sometimes that was not always under full load. Often that would be the day packs too. So we had research agendas while we were there. So each participant had a species of interest that they were interested in recording, surveying, and censusing. So I think probably total uh, somewhere between 60, 70, maybe 80 miles on a given trip. Okay, and it's, it is exhausting, but it's a good exhaustion. You know, I don't really quite notice it. Let's keep moving here. Uh, this is just uh, Los Gemelos, the twins. 
Uh, we always use this as a photo op whenever we were there. This is in the northern part of the country. Um, sorry, I don't mean to rush you by, but these trees were joined at some point in their early growth stages. And uh, so the Costa Ricans have a sign there, which literally means the twins, which we always thought was cool. So it was always kind of a welcome landmark when we were hiking up, uh, up Rincon de la Deja. This wasn't even a halfway point, so we didn't stay for too long, but uh, it definitely represented uh, female power too, Shakti. Uh, the Colectivo was the major transport from Liberia to uh, Karate and then to Sovena, and it's uh, called the Colectivo because everybody gets on it. Um, so they were usually crowded. Uh, they would form rivers. They were the big land crawlers. Um, and it was very cheap, so we, we asked our students to take it rather than hiring taxis, you know, which are full drives. Uh, and they didn't mind at all because we got to actually communicate and talk to the locals. The locals were always interested in what we were doing, why we were doing it, where we were from. You know, and, and um, the Costa Ricans are amazing people. They're just so, so uh, personable and proud of their country that it's easy to just listen to them talk. And they're all expert naturalists, too. So we got to see a lot of really cool sightings right out the Colectivo on the way through the forest. Uh, so this is the fourth species of primate that we would see routinely. That's a spider monkey, Central American spider monkey. Uh, they were hard to see because they were usually so high up in the canopy uh, that we don't have a lot of really great photos of them. Uh, but this one was right uh, roadside during the collectivo. Uh, they're a little mischievous. Uh, they'll drop sticks uh, and nuts uh, on you uh, as tourists. And I don't know why they do that, um, but I guess I would do it too. You know, a lot of, lot of idle time, they're well fed. They're really the chief uh, predators of fruit in the rainforest, so they're well fed by 11 o'clock, and they have nothing but time on their hands, so they look for mischief. And, uh, and sometimes they find it. They also had a habit of urinating on tourists as well. Um, this is just an informative session. We're talking about some of the things that we've seen, uh, plotting our next strategy, probably planning our next transect. Weatherproof notebooks. Hummingbirds. Lots of hummingbirds, especially at the Monte Verde. Now, this is a feeder. The feeders don't grow wild. But at Monte Verde, to encourage tourists up to the ranger station, the, the pathways are lined with all manner of sugar feeders. And those 52 species of hummingbird countrywide, I think 36 of them are in Monte Verde or San Elena, which is the, the school children's rainforest network. Um, and it's, it's like a cloud of, of bees all the time. And we had a hard time pulling our students away from this particular aspect because it's, they're like flying jewels. You know, they're just so, so charismatic. And uh, very feisty as, as well. You may, you may have seen uh, even our ruby throated hummingbird kind of chest bump uh, competitors for the source of sugar. Um, so they're really uh, totally amazing. Insects, uh, of the 750,000 species of insects, I will be honest with you, I don't know how we know that. It's a number that the Ministry of Tourism puts out, but it is backed up by the work of someone I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce to you in a moment. This is Dr. Terry Irwin. Uh, he works, he's an entomologist for the Smithsonian. And some of his early work as an entomologist in the rainforest of Panama and Bolivia yielded uh, new data on how many species of, of life forms must be on this planet. For a long time, we kind of capped it at 10 million. And now we're able to lose two of them. But it keeps on creeping up or due to work by scientists like Terry Irwin, and they pick a, a windless night, and they'll, they'll shoot a, a biodegradable pesticide into the canopy of a single tree. And over the next 24 hours, insects rain down the collecting tarps. Bioethics aside, that's a, a stunningly effective way to collect insects for identification. Okay. Perry estimates that, Dr. Irwin estimates that uh, each tree has 20,000 species of insect, representing over 6,000 different species. And 80% of them are new to science every time he did it. So because of forays into the tropical canopy like this, bringing the insects down instead of trying to go up, uh, they estimate, Kerry estimates that the number of living things on this planet must be 30 million, maybe even 100 million. We don't have any real way of knowing that. But when expeditions like this continue to produce new species that have not been identified or cataloged by science, it's not hard to use your imagination and, and extrapolate into the future to see that this planet uh, has life forms on it that we may never actually catalog. Is there any problem with the biodiversity? Like Is something happening to the biodiversity in Costa Rica, do you mean? Yeah. Yes, Costa Rica is actually uh, facing a lot, we're almost not close, a lot of the same pressures that tropical nations are facing. And so I'm, I'm going to end with that, maybe ill advisedly. 
um, because I would, I would uh, totally applaud your going to Costa Rica uh, and involve yourself in the ecotourism for reasons that I'll share with you. So we will talk about that. Costa Rica has uh, INBIO, it's the Institute of Biodiversity, and a lot of um, uh, native scientists work there at cataloging pythons. And so there's, there's some specters that may be reducing uh, biodiversity in Costa Rica. One group of vertebrates that is affected right now are the amphibians, specifically frogs. So they're having trouble worldwide, and it's no different in Costa Rica. It's, it's interesting. I think Costa Rica has had much more success at preserving biodiversity because they've committed to it. It's, there's this national inertia that starts at the top with the presidential administration and it goes all the way down to the school children. The schoolhouses are festooned with scarlet macaws, paintings, not rivers, um, and, and, and resplendent quetzal and tapir. And the, and the kids know the biodiversity. It's the backyard ecology is right there for them. So I, I think that I, I, I wouldn't say that. That's not true of Belize, okay? But I, I know it to be true of Costa Rica that they have um, a, a full board commitment to preserving biodiversity in spite of the challenges um, that, that tropical countries that are somewhat poor still face. You know, they're, they're achieving some success, um, unlike some even the neighbors, you know, even Central America, so. Is there a certain invasive species that's like threatening Costa Rica that they're trying to fight? Um, that's a great question, and I, I have to say that um, off the top of my head, mosquitoes um, are transmitting avian malaria. Um, and as, we'll talk climate change in, uh, in just a second here, but as, as the cloud line goes higher and higher, the mosquitoes are, are going higher and higher, and they're actually afflicting birds that have never dealt with mosquitoes before. And as such, they're predisposed to, or vulnerable to, different types of malaria. Um, and some of the mosquitoes are not from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is home to many, many mosquitoes of their own, okay, but the birds have evolved with those. So, so uh, invasive uh, and exotic insects probably um, are having a, a real insidious effect, okay, in terms of bird health. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of invasive species that have been planted by design, and we'll actually get to that. And I think what I'm about to show you is probably uh, the, has the biggest impact on biodiversity, okay. So it's a very good question. Uh, I, uh, Peterson's guide say that just for wildflower diversity here in New Jersey or in the you know, east central region of, of floral, floral region, floristic region, that 60% of the plants are from somewhere else. So I don't think Costa Rica can expect to be any different in that regard. Um, so there, that there's probably a full, a full uh, you know, response to that to try to actually control the, the flood of invasive species because we know how that can change habitats. I just wanted to point out to you that this is Costa Rica from their Ministry of Tourism, and it's showing you what part of their GDP is actually derived from tourism. A big part of that is ecotourism. So uh, the big pink section right here shows that of the $49 billion in, in uh, GDP that they generate on an annual basis, uh, that's largely due to tourism and no longer due to agriculture. When we started this program, the chief exports were coffees and bananas. Now the chief export for Costa Rica is ecotourism. Okay? More of a saying, just a, a sensing that we're getting close to uh, how are we doing? Okay. Um, okay, and I just wanted to share with you, I'm making a plea for ecotourism here on the behalf of Costa Rica, that a lot of tropical nations have wildlife that is so worth seeing, so worth traveling to. And the statistics and data bear that out, that people are responding from wealthy nations like the US, for example, like Europe. Um, and the money there is actually has a multiplying effect on the local economies. So that the natives uh, and the populace of these countries that house most of our world's biodiversity are seeing more and more return from conserving that biodiversity. So that's the real beauty of ecotourism, uh, is that the money that we bring is invested locally. We made sure that we did that. We didn't eat at Burger King. We, we ate at local you know, sodas and, and small family establishments there, when, when we didn't eat our own cooking, which was increasingly awful. Um, so 
Uh, ecotourism is a real answer to biodiversity concerns around the world. Uh, and then this, this uh, is a slide just talking about emerging threats, and Costa Rica is no different. Um, I would actually point out biofuel production. Costa Rica is a country that wants to emerge, wants to be independent from an external source of energy. And as a consequence, every year that we went back there, we saw more and more forest that was converted to sugarcane. Sugarcane obviously is an important agricultural product, but it's also a biofuel. And more and more forest conversion to African oil products. So these are the invasive species that, that I was referencing and that these are intentionally planted as these huge monoculture plantations. Uh, and as a consequence of that, there's been a lot of forest conversion uh, in Costa Rica over the last, say, 18 years of our program that we've seen firsthand. If you set aside like Del Monte and Dole Corporation with bananas and pineapples, uh, every country needs to have a GDP, it needs to actually have an agricultural sector, but we're seeing more and more of tropical forests being converted to biofuel production so that these countries can achieve something close to energy independence. And I see that as a real problem, and I don't see an easy answer for that. Uh, Costa Rica knows the, the risks of this, they know the stakes, and so I think if we're going to see an answer to it, it's probably going to be in Costa Rica or countries like Costa Rica. This shows you the understory of a healthy secondary growth rainforest, and it shows you what's, what it looks like inside of a oil palm plantation. So there's nothing remotely close with regard to biodiversity for using that as a measuring standard. Um, I would say that all of these countries, including our own, have biodiversity in the question mark and then increasing pressures that are societal, cultural, if you will, like poaching, for example, commercial hunting. Uh, ecological pressures like the emergence of parasitic diseases or pathogens, invasive species, that's an ecological paradigm. And of course, economic pressures as well. Um, all of that fits within what we don't know about climate change and how that's going to affect these habitats. And the only one that I would say is a really cool um, item here that wealthy nations can participate in the biodiversity of these tropical nations is swapping debt for nature. A lot of tropical nations have burgeoning debt to wealthy predator nations. And predator nations like the U.S. are forgiving that debt. They're actually saying, we're going to take the money or the interest from this, these loans, and we're going to ask you to put it back into your own country, measurable um, and uh, measurable ways in terms of conservation efforts. And so that's what we mean by debt for nature. And so look for that increasingly in the future. Um, I'm optimistic about that. I hope that that's the case. This is a nighttime shot from the Pacific Ocean from what we consider to be luxurious accommodations while they own it in Fort Prado. What it even means. I don't know what it means. Everybody says it for lots of reasons, but in this case, it's kind of like, you know, be happy. Live a secure life, but it's their expression. They're saying, it's going to be fine. Don't you worry. So that's all I have for you tonight. Like La Selva, for example. 
uh, Mondo Verdi. So if I was going to be an ecologist or an entomologist or a botanist uh, studying an ethnobotany, I would, I would do my, my month internship in some place in Costa Rica. And I don't know how that started, except that it was easy to get to. The dangers were low. A lot of, uh, there, there's not much crime. I mean, there's nonviolent crime. We've, we've been victimized by some you know, minor inconveniences. But, so there's a lot of things about Costa Rica that's just attractive uh, culturally, economically, and ecologically that, that makes us know about it. And I think that that's kind of been a, uh, uh, what I'm for here, kind of a synergistic relationship with the scientific community. And as the Costa Rican uh, authorities you know, sense that, wow, there's a real chance for income here for lift our people, it just kind of take on the life of the But having said that, you know, Costa Rica is, is facing uh, severe pressures too. So only 25% of the country is under conservation. You know, why not 55%? Our country doesn't come close to 25%, so I'm not I'm saying a tongue in cheek, but I think that Costa Rica understands that uh, if we don't do it now, it's going to get increasingly difficult to protect biodiversity. Uh, pharmaceutical companies too are really super interested in um, the ethnobotany and, and what would exist and what the natives know about the plants uh, and, and what medicines would be synthesized from them. So that that, that influx of cash uh, helps too. But I didn't really answer your question, but I'm, I'm not sure if there's an easy answer for that, but it could be the synergistic effect of a lot of different reasons. So. Good time for a question. We have uh, another question. <laughs> I, you know what, I didn't actually include any pictures of the facilities because, you know, just in case you might want to go, but then I might forget. But um, cold water showers, often. The, all right, the males rarely shower. The females were always looking for a shower, and if the shower wasn't available, the ocean was right there in most cases, okay? But yeah, usually the, the facilities we stayed at were research stations. And they were rustic at best, but there was usually some spigot somewhere that had cold water. Protecting the environment. Um, 
have war watershed education as well. Um, a lot of the, the mountaintops in Costa Rica are not deforested. Uh, they're left intact as watersheds. Um, you know, we, we have some of our most valuable real estate at altitude and coastlines. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting that doesn't happen in Costa Rica, but I think there's a real um, momentum against doing that. Um, so, tough question. No, good answer, though, but education always makes sense. <laughs> Let's say thank you, Mr. Chamberlain. If you have questions, please feel free to